The news now in detail. In the never-ending drama of the 8th Parliament, the new Patriotic Party NPP caucus in the House has requested for an emergency recall of the legislature. The emergency request comes barely 24 hours after the Speaker, Alban Babin, adjourned sitting indefinitely yesterday. In a letter addressed to the Speaker, the NPP caucus highlighted some important government business that has to be approved. Some of the significant matters listed in the letter include tax exemptions for companies under the One District, One Factory Program, Bills and Financial Stability Fund, citing the Constitution and Parliament Standing Orders. The NPP caucus noted that the Speaker Babin is bound to recall Parliament in seven days after receiving the letter. Let me now take you through some legal basis for this request on your screens right now. To ensure clarity and emphasize the legal foundation of this request, the NPP caucus respectfully draws your attention to the following provisions presented. Under the standing order 513, it reiterates 531, it reiterates that despite any other provision, 15% of the members of parliament will request a meeting of parliament and the speaker shall within seven days after the receipt of the request summon parliament. It goes further to say that parliament shall convene within seven days after the issuance of the notice of summons. The Speaker may summon a sitting of the House before the date or time to which the House has been adjourned or at any date or time after the House has been adjourned, Senedine. The Speaker may also summon a sitting of the House before the date or time to which the House has been adjourned or at any date. These are urgent matters for consideration. These are the bills. These include the Environmental Protection Agency Bill 2024, Social Protection Bill, the Customs Amendment Bill, the Budget Bill, the Ghana Boundary Commission Bill, as well as the Interstate Succession Bill. Right. So we can all go live on the phone, Portia, to speak to Member of Parliament for South Dai, uh, Roxin Nelson Dafiamekpo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dafiamekpo, for your time. Um, as been rightly uh, pointed out by my colleague, Portia Gabo, there's quite a lot of government business to deal with in the House of Parliament. And I'm just wondering if this recall uh, is not justified. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm grateful to have joined you. Uh, let me say good evening to my constituents in the Kikali province of Congo. Uh, first of all, this recall is a classical example of an abuse of the parliamentary processes as a result to us. Few abuse, nothing more. Now, you are aware that this group of MPs, the NPC group of MPs in Parliament, wrote a letter dated 31st July, the day after Speaker had attended the second meeting, was the second meeting of the life of this Parliament in this year. Had come to an end on 30th July. On 31st, they wrote a very scathing letter, practically insulting the speaker and canvassing some grounds for purposes of a recall. And if you, if you, if if, you, if your producer can dig up that letter, check if there's any difference between that the letter they wrote, the grounds. They canvas in, in that memo to speaker asking for the recall under emergency circumstances in this one. Nothing. In fact, the only difference is that they change the date. So, for instance, how does the 2022 bill, instance, 2022 instance, this succession bill become a matter of, of urgent public importance? How? Ah, uh, is that possible? Because that bill has been sitting before Parliament for the past three years. And mind you, the NDC in Parliament, we don't control, we are not, we are not, we, we don't dictate government business. Government business is dictated by uh, the Honorable Affection Martin, who now is a minority leader. And so, you, you just can't understand this guy. But what we are saying is that uh, I've already said it somewhere tonight that 
I'm also going for constitutional interpretation as to whether or not the constitutional provision being invoked by the entity members in parliament, the minority group in parliament of record, uh, is, is, is right or not. But, but Roxanne, um, it's often been said that even in court, there must be an end to litigation. Uh, this, you know, eighth parliament has been saddled with a lot of controversy. I mean, aren't you ready to move beyond all the controversies and consider that we do have a lot of government business to transact? Why don't you put the nation first, the interests of the general public, and consider the fact that there are things to be done in parliament? Let's find a way to talk about this and go back to parliament. The people who have been given the power, the executive power of state to exercise, which is the NPP, are toying with the interest of the state. And I've given you a picture. I told you that on 30th of July this year, just last July, the speaker determined that we didn't have much to do because government business, business before him, there was very little to do because if you went to the chamber and you asked government for business, they were not ready. They had gone to their constituencies and they were campaigning. So eventually, ready? so now they say they are ready to do business. Hold on, hold on. What is hold your on, side and the what is please, your side can you, going? Can you to, to me? Can we you don't have much time, Rox, and I just want to find out what no, do you no, intend no. to do. So, so, so. So let me make the submission so that in their own letter, in their own letter before Parliament, they listed a lot of bills and motions that, and that is the thing that were of urgent nature as far back as 31st of July 2024. When Speaker gave them the opportunity to for a recall, and they came, they came to Parliament. We spent two days in Parliament. These guys didn't do that. So after two days of wasting everybody's time, we went away. Then the ordinary, ordinary, ordinary session of Parliament being on holiday came to an end. So speaker summoned us on the on the fifteenth day of October, twenty twenty four, to come back to start the third meeting of parliament for the fourth year. Now, for the first week, the government, the NPP, the NPP party, which has formed government, will not pay attention to business on the floor. Go and check, go and check for instance, other paper for the 16th day of, 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 of October. Hold on, I have it in my hand, so if you are leaving, let me read. You've got to make it very snappy, uh, Roxy. Hold on. We, yeah, we don't I'll have much time. Snappy. I'm afraid I can't I'll take... Make it very, very snappy. Right. They are, for instance, the Constitution of the Republic of Ghana Amendment Bill. It was advertised. Then we had advert... I'm afraid it looks like we've lost Rox and the Fiamic Ball. Uh, on the phone lines, but you're still watching News 360. If you just tuned in, this is our major news bulletin. We're streaming live on Facebook, also live on your DSTV channel 279. In more news tonight, the new patriotic party has accused the opposition NDC of attempting to rig the 2024 general elections using what they describe as crude, undemocratic and unpatriotic methods contained in a document the NPP has uncovered. Director of Communications of the party, Richard Ahiadba, says recent happenings in Parliament are all contained in the documents. There's more in this report. The New Patriotic Party claims to have uncovered a confidential document from the National Democratic Congress, which they describe as a strategic blueprint aimed at seizing power through underhand tactics. Moving on to the NDC's document to win uh, the election 2024, which I've just shown you, our verification shows it's not a fake document. It's a true document, a document the NDC has been working with. The document consists of 11 chapters, each directing the NDC on various disruptive 
unfair and outright crude tactics has a central objective, which is for the NDC to obtain power by every means necessary, fair or foul, but primarily through foul means. Addressing the media, NPP Communications Director Richard Ayagba alleged that the document exposes the opposition's intention to frustrate government efforts and bring the nation to a standstill. From what we have read in the document, the NDC had a plan right from January 8, 2021 to frustrate the government and make it unpopular through foul means to win power December 7, 2024. This document we have uncovered from the NDC promotes crude, undemocratic and unpatriotic means of achieving political power. He pointed to recent development in Parliament stating that the document outlines a deliberate strategy to disrupt the legislative process, allegedly with the involvement of Speaker Alban Gbagwin. What is not expected is the active participation of Mr. Speaker. As a friend of mine would say, Mr. Speaker has crossed the be careful line. In other words, Mr. Speaker is beyond redemption as a statement who ought to help glue Parliament together and see to government business to further the lots of Ghanaians. Mr. Speaker is irredeemable. So you have a situation where the NDC, for some odd reason, decides that it wants to be majority. And so therefore, in partnership with Speaker, Mr. Speaker is actively aiding that seeming coup d'etat by the NDC in Parliament. Commending the MPP Kirkers in Parliament for displaying maturity and observing the rule of law, Richard Ayagwa accused the NDC of masterminding the country's need for an IMF bailout, amongst others. The NDC was actively canvassing and promoting that the government goes, to an, uh, goes for an IMF program. Nobody knew that it was part of a grand scheme to create a financial squeeze for the country hence but i submit to you with the evidence from this dark document you see that that was just a ploy and in fact they the ndc were creating uh, the condition for the eventual uh, acceptance to go to imf because they have deliberately disrupted and ensured that government business will not pass in parliament this is your election command center. Now, flag bearer of the new patriotic party, Dr. Mamadou Baumia, has appealed to the chiefs, clergy, and Muslim clerics to repose confidence in him to resolve their challenges. Now, speaking on a store of the Volta region, Dr. Baumia explained that a vote for him will set a mechanized system to support the production of rice, which is the mainstay of the people of Ketu North. If you vote for Baumia, you will have accountability. You will have accountability. Because I have to come back. I have to come back in four years' time and tell the people of Ketu North what I have done for them. Toby had mentioned that we need to revamp uh, the Georgia Technical uh, uh, and Vocational School because it was only recently, I think that was last year, that was given the free TVET status. And the other technical and vocational schools, we have sent state-of-the-art equipment. We need to bring some to uh, the, the school here. So that is something that is required. The town roads is another major problem uh, that we need to address as quickly as possible. possible. The VETA to Georgia Road is also another one that has been mentioned. The water treatment. Uh, facilities and also water. So because I know I have to give an account, I'm going to work very hard to deliver for you so that in four years I can say I finished this road, I finished this water, and so on. And the flag bearer of the NDC has outlined his vision to revitalize markets across the country. Speaking on his Greater Accra Regional Campaign Tour, John Mahama says it remains a priority of the NDC to modernize traditional markets, incorporating essential amenities that are welcome to both patrons and market women. The World Market Association, NDC Caucus, welcome. We have a program in our manifesto, 
we call the market enhancement program. If you look in this country, most of the modern markets that exist have been built under NDC administration. A market must be inviting for people to be able to go in and buy. A market must be appetizing. Nobody wants to go into a market which is muddy and go and dirty their feet. And so we have a market enhancement program. We're going to identify key markets, key markets across the country, and we're going to modernize those markets, make them very nice so that our mothers and sisters can get a good place to do their trade. Ezu, Candy Siba, Jan or New York, Ghana Fair, Wabasa, Kony, or Mami Meke, or Sisters, eh, Abana, eh, Henny, Henny, a four, ni a ketchuni, a Jacque Mofiamo, Sponny, a Baya Jano, no Oyafe, oh, oh, your feet. No Yafe, oh, Nina, Potto, 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 Mofiamo, Sponakai. We are going to promote vocational skills amongst young people so that young people can learn a skill. And when you learn a skill, we'll give you a certificate. So when we're recruiting into the security services, because with the 24-hour economy, we realize that we'll need about 25,000 more police officers. Presidential candidate of the All People's Congress, Hassan Ayariga, says an APC government will in 2025 replace the meter billing system for electricity and water with a flat rate. Now, during his engagement with the leadership of the Ghana Union of Traders Association, GUTA, the APC leader also emphasized the need to promote commerce by reducing taxes to five. Hassan Ayaruga called on the leadership of the Ghana Union of Traders, GUTA, to discuss his vision and policies with them. Hassan Ayaruga expressed his commitment to prioritize trade and commerce for rapid economic growth and sustainability. The APC leader is confident of implementing a duty-free port and scrap some taxes. And that when I become president, all of you will bring in your goods, free duty, no more duty on any commodity. No more duty. I am not coming to promise you anything. I am telling you the policy. This is not a promise. Including cars. Including cars, everything, free duty. Togo is doing it right here. So the duty free, there are going to be only five taxes in Ghana. That is the pork charges, shipping charges, Ghana revenue, the charges, home building income taxes, and the last one are the levies. Every levy, whatever levy it is, will all come under one charge. When elected into office in 2025, Hassan Ayaruga says he will scrap the meter billing system for electricity and water supply in the country. Under the APC, we are going to introduce what is called the flat rate for ECG, flat rate for Ghana water. No more meters. Meters are deceptive. Meters are a form of taking people's money. Meters are used to lie to people. Your meter is reading more than you are consuming. And the ECG is ripping Kenyans off. A permanent ban on the operation of black market forest bureaus will also feature prominently as part of measures to stabilize the city against other trading currencies. President of the Ghana Union of Traders Association, Dr. Joseph Obin, wants the next administration to implement drastic measures to deal with the dominance of foreigners in the local retailing space. We can all migrate into manufacturing when the foreigners are being allowed to come into the trade to the shortest, to take us back. So it should be a comprehensive uh, policy of states that they do everything, use investment laws to contain the foreign traders from coming in. On Galamse, the Guta president called for a different methodology in mining that will not harm the environment. Stanley Niblew, TV3 News, Accra. In more news tonight, Oliver Bakavomawo has been speaking for the first time since his release on bail 
the constitutional rights and policy strategy advisor to pressure group, was one of 54 protesters arrested, charged to court and subsequently released on bail. In a soon-to-air episode on hot issues with Kemini Amano, he explains why he demobilized the police tow truck as seen in the now viral video. We were standing, we had brought a truck which contained medicine, food and water and placards for protesters. It had been parked under the trees that was attended near the Chotro station. Not even on, on the road. It was been stopped there, the driver was out, things like that. Then we saw police officers forming uh, a wall around the vehicle. My understanding, initial, initially I had assumed that they were trying to prevent the vehicle from moving onto the streets. Mm -hmm. So I just came and told the driver, there was a laptop which was exposed. Take the laptop, raise the windows and close it and go. So that, I mean, they make, it is clear to them that this vehicle wasn't going anywhere. So we're standing there when we saw them bring a tow truck and immediately proceeded to tow the truck. Our initial instinct in that moment was to prevent it. So we stood in front of it as individuals in a way in which somebody, an environmental protester, might chain themselves to a tree in the hope that the tree is saved. So we were, you know, putting our bodies on the line to protect it. Obviously, it meant nothing to them. And we started seeing the tow truck get into under our legs. And the video supports this. And so... Even one of the guys fell on the tow, on the tow truck. I see. And I left, and I, so I walked from it. So I started walking around the tow truck to see, is there a way in which you can demobilize this truck in fear that it might injure the individuals who were there? So it's, I, I went around it. I couldn't see how. Then I got to the, where the driver was supposed to be. There was no driver in. Immediately, I mean, I am even thinking, but this is so in, security incompetent to be able to leave a vehicle running in this scenario. So my first instinct is that I, I, I turn it off so that it stops. Reflecting on the incident, yeah. do you think it was a reckless thing you did? I think that it is reckless to deny citizens of their rights. I, I would do it today and I would do it ever consistently. And in fact, I would invite every citizen whose rights have been oppressed, whether you are subject to unlawful arrest or unlawful seizure of property, that you are constitutionally entitled to resist it. Don't look at the fact that the individuals who are involved in that are police officers. In fact, our anthem mandates us that those who are more likely to oppress us is those who must resist. So for me, it makes no difference as to who is entitled to violate rights and who is supposed to be able to protect themselves. Protect yourself always. More of that interview with Kemene Amano. Now, Azizanya, one of the communities hardest hit by the cholera outbreak in the Adar East District, is in dire need of toilet facilities and clean water. In the wake of increasing cases, the District Security Coordinating Council is considering a ban on all social gatherings, while its counterpart, the Adar West District, has already banned the sharing of food and drinks at funerals. My colleague Sarah Penkwa reports. Azizanya is a coastal community in the Adar East District, with residents who are predominantly fishers. Residents have been in distress in the last two weeks, following the outbreak of cholera in the Ada East and West districts. The community has been hit hard owing to a general lack in good hygiene. I was told by one of the health workers that about say 70 people at the facility, Azizanya is recording about 40. Within a week to two me, we are recording the highest number of cases in the uh, health centre. This river is their main source of livelihood for fishing and other household chores. The only toilet facility that would have served the community has been abandoned for the past 11 years, promoting opinification along the banks of the river and in the bushes. An act which is a major contributing factor to the spread of cholera. Some people, they will go to the clinic and come back and suddenly it will uh, like they'll be vomiting again and they'll take them back again. Some of the villagers have been going to the bush and some also have been going to the seaside. We don't have a toilet here and the water too, we need it the most because the river water is not safe for us again. We need a toilet facility. Auntie Koliki, whose child got infected with cholera, has not forgotten the ordeal. My child was infected. We spent three days at the hospital. It hasn't been easy. 
The National Commission for Civic Education has also intensified awareness creation in the two districts. Throughout the weekend, we were the uh, Pute, the, all the coastal areas, even market day. It was agreed at the meeting that the, they will meet with the traditional authority to see how best there could be a limit to social gatherings. The outbreak of the disease and the upsurge in infections have been a major public health concern for authorities. Currently, the communities are being supplied with water twice every week to ensure availability of clean water. But how sustainable is this intervention? We are sure that by the time tankers will not be able to go again, community water will finish with their extension and therefore water should be flowing into the, those communities. The district chief executive of the Ada West district, Samson Tete, said although his district is not hard hit, interventions being rolled out will be reviewed. History beckons for Ghana's Foreign Affairs Minister Shirley Ayoko Butri to become the first Ghanaian to be elected as Secretary General of the Commonwealth. She has promised to focus her tenure in office on democratic resilience of member states and economic and climate resilience, which has plagued many island states. Martin Isidudate reports. The Commonwealth has a population of about 2.7 billion people made up of 56 independent member states comprising 21 African countries, 13 countries from the Caribbean and Americas, 11 countries from the Pacific, 8 countries in Asia and 3 from Europe. This includes the United Kingdom which has ties with all these countries due to its colonial history with the countries. The role of the Secretary General of the Commonwealth is primarily to encourage countries to uphold the values and tenets of the Commonwealth, which include democracy, human rights, rule of law, amongst others. Ghana's Shirley Ayokobuchi, who has been canvassing for votes across member states, is coming up against stiff competition from two other African countries, Joshua Foho Satipa of Lesotho and Mamadou Tangara of The Gambia. Outlining what her key priorities will be if she becomes Secretary General of the Commonwealth, Shelley Ayokobuchi noted that she will ensure, amongst others, that member countries focus on six thematic areas. I desire for me, the Commonwealth, to be a leader for democratic renewal and for a bold response to climate change and for a development cooperation framework that guarantees inclusive economic growth, guaranteed social mobility and effective social protection for all generations. Um, through my extensive engagement with leaders across the world, I have been able to shape my priorities. And for me, democracy, good governance, uh, Commonwealth values, is the overarching one. Trade and investment is another. Youth education skills, innovation, innovation and startups, climate change, small island developing states and small states managing resources for an effective Commonwealth institution. On climate change, which affects mainly about 33 of the Commonwealth countries, Shirley Ayokobochi said she will increase advocacy for climate funding for these member states. Just to watch in News 360, now people from all walks of life, friends, loved ones, join the family of Justin Agbenu to pay their last respects to one of the teens who lost their lives in a devastating car accident at East Lagon. Now from family to the ordinary guests who managed to utter a word, just, justice must be served to deter others. Judge Quinnin has more. <laughs> A solemn day indeed, grief sweeping through the aching hearts of many. Many who could not endure the pain of losing a 12-year-old whose greatest desire of becoming a biologist centered on her love for humanity. Jasna Nagbenu was one of the teens who died in October 12 at East Legon through a ghastly car accident involving the son of Bishop Salifu Amwakon. High-profile personalities, including the Attorney General and Minister of Justice, Godfrey Dame, NDC parliamentary candidate for Ayawasu West Warbos, John Dumelo, 
MPP General Secretary Justin Kodia, among others, were spotted at the memorial service. Legon. To be honest with you, most of the roads have speed ramps, and I think that is the only road that doesn't have any speed ramp, the inner roads, if you look at it. And so I think as a matter of urgency, speed ramps should be constructed there. The wheels of justice this time should not grind slowly. It should, it should serve um, as quickly as possible and be a deterrent to those who um, actually take our uh, roads for, for granted and do as they please on our roads. Parish priest of St. Theresa's Church, Reverend Francis Dixon Amenuvo, whilst condemning bad parenting, prayed for a forgiving heart for Justin's family. What can we do? We just pray that parents will be more responsible. We are praying that we will not allow recklessness in our society. For me, a 16-year-old boy to be driving is sheer recklessness. Justin Agbenu goes home today. Reminders to watch in News 360, our major news bulletin for the day. May the souls of the departed rest in perfect peace. We'll take a short break. We have more coming up shortly. Hello, good evening and welcome to the sports segment here on News 360 with me, Horir Kuampofo. We do start off from the under-20 camp, uh, that's the Black Satellites who finished top of Group A at the ongoing Wafu under-20 Zone B Championships after a one-all draw with Togo, the host, in their last group game. Jerry Afriye, who is the striker for Ghana, gave the team an early lead with his third goal of the tournament before the Togolese equalised in the second half. Ghana finished the group stages with five points ahead of Niger, who picked up four points after beating Benin 1-0 in their final game. The Black Satellites now await their opponent in the semi-finals of the competition. Remember that it's only the two finalists who qualify for the AFCON, that's the under-20 AFCON. And so the Black Satellites are just one more win away from qualifying for the competition. But let's do some Ghanaian players abroad where Abdul Mumin has been named as the Rayo Vallecano Player of the Month for September. The defender was a very key player uh, for the Rayo team that went unbeaten throughout the month despite facing strong opposition such as Atletico Madrid and then Girona. Mumin scored one goal and helped the team concede uh, just three goals in September. His thunderous goal against Osasuna that sparked the comeback victory also won a Liga goal of the month for September. Uh, we move to England where Antoine Semenyo uh, has won the Bournemouth Player of the Month and also the goal of the month for September. The Ghanaian played every game for the Cherries in September and continued his brilliant start to the season which saw him adjudged as the Bournemouth Player of the Month for August, the forward has scored the most goals, that's three, for the club in the Premier League this season. Well, before we go, let's get the latest scores from the UEFA Champions League uh, match day three action in the league phase. Uh, Atlanta already played uh, in the first game, they're drawing with Celtic and then Brest uh, also being held by Leverkusen there. Those are the two early kickoffs. Uh, Barcelona uh, actually have doubled that scoreline and so they lead by three goals to one against Bayern Munich. Feyenoord lead Benfica by two goals to nil. Young boys are currently holding Inter Milan to a goalless draw. Red Bull Salzburg also doing the same with Dinamo. And then Atletico Madrid have an early lead through Julian Alvarez. Liverpool also lead Leipzig. And then Manchester City lead Sparta Praha through a Phil Foden goal. Or if you want updates on all these games, you can follow our social media uh, coverage at 3 Sports GH on Facebook, Instagram, and then on X. My name is Aurelio Kwampofo, and up next on the bulletin is Entertainment with Ajoanuela. Well, good evening. Let's get into some entertainment news updates here on News 360. My name is Noela Donko. Now, Ghanaian actress and mother of five, Nadia Bwari, says being a mother is her greatest achievement. She's also been opening up about her greatest lesson after two decades of acting. I don't lie, but I think, I, I think it's my greatest achievement. Your greatest achievement? Yeah, I think, I think being a mother is my 
you don't know what it feels like. I mean, this is not to say to like the, uh, this is, I mean, I'm not trying to sound any way to the people who cannot, are not able to have their own kids, but um, being a mother is just, it's, it's, it's beautiful. You wake up, you've actually created little human beings and you wake up in the morning and they look at you and they smile and all you hear is, I love you, mama. Aww. And I think is, and my kids love to remind me how much they love me. Mm. And I think it's the best thing in the world for me, even when I have a very chaotic day. In your greatest lesson, having been in this industry for over two decades, what would you say you've learned so well? And if you could go back to just correct a few things and change your world? I think I'll trust less. A lot of people don't understand why I keep to myself. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't understand why every time I have a break, I go into my car and I'm at my friend. Like he said, if you get to know me, you would know that I'm the goofiest person. And a lot of people would say, and people misconstrue that as arrogant, yeah. you know, and, but I'm not at all. It's just, I've learned the hard way not to trust anybody, you know? So if I would do this, go, if I would go back to start all over, mm -hmm. I would just go and do my job and go and go home. Mm. Yeah. Now to some more stories, British actor Idris Elba has said that he will relocate to Africa within the next decade as part of his plans to support the continent movie industry. The 52-year-old star of the hit series, The Wire, is behind nascent projects to build a film studio on the Tanzanian islands of Zanzibar as well as one in the Ghanaian capital, Accra. Born in London, Alba, whose mother is from Ghana and father from Sierra Leone, has a strong attachment to Africa. He wants to leverage his star power to back its growing film business. And he, as he says, it is vital that Africans get to tell their own stories. I think I'll move in the next five, ten years. God willing, I'm here to bolster the film industry. That is a ten-year process. I won't be able to do that from overseas. I need to be in-country, on-continent, he noted. Well, that'll be it for the entertainment news segment here on News 360. My name is Noella Donko. Thank you so much, Noella. Coming up, international news. Nigerian President Bola Tinubu has reshuffled his 45-member cabinet, naming seven new ministers, sacking five and reassigning ten others to new portfolios. The ministers of Finance, Defence, National Planning and two junior energy ministers all retain their positions. The reshuffle includes renaming the Ministry of Niger Delta Development to the Ministry of Regional Development, the winding up of the Ministry of Sports, and the merger of the Ministries of Tourism and Arts and Culture. Four people were tagged, adding three of the injured and in critical condition. TV broadcasters showed footage of armed assailants entering the Tusas building. Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan, alongside other world leaders and the EU, condemned the attack. Everybody is still watching News 360 Live from a news hub here at Adesawe in Kanda, Accra. We've got to say bye-bye to you at this time, but just stay informed with the very latest news, updates, and exclusive videos by following us on Instagram at 3news.gh. Get breaking news stories, code cards, and behind-the-scenes content all in one place. Don't miss out. Follow us at 3news.gh now. That's all for the news. For more news, you can do well to visit our website. It's www.3news.com. My name is Pa Kwesi Asari. And I am Portia Gabo. Good evening.